Um, for anybody who hasn't put their face on the screen, um, please do. Makes it more fun. Let's everybody see everybody, and being together is a good thing. Um, it is a bit serendipitous that we're having this conversation about hope in crisis and leadership in crisis right now. It could not be more timely. I, I wish to say that we had the genius to know that we had this timing right, but um, we had uh, hoped to do this a while back, but the timeliness could not be uh, more apropos. We're all fighting two viruses, two, two invisible viruses. We know that. Um, one of them's medical, and with um, the effort and focus that's on it, I would hope to think that we will have a solution for that um, in the nearer future. The second invisible virus that we've been fighting and we're still fighting doesn't even need to be said. Um, it's a virus that we fought for thousands of years since man aggregated into tribes. It's continually mutated, and it's for us to continually fight. I would say as a, uh, a Jewish person, it's something that's, uh, there's a, a quote that Martin Luther King, uh, the Reverend, repeated that was, um, if any of us are slaves, we're all slaves, and if any of us aren't free, none of us are free. And I, I couldn't think of a a more profound and subtle statement. And um, it's, a, it's a great time to have this conversation. And even though we're talking to an admiral, we'll be talking about other things, I think everything we're talking about couldn't be more germane than any conversation we could have at the moment. Um, so um, by introduction, um, I've spent some time with the admiral before, and I know he doesn't really enjoy long introductions. So I'm going to make a short one. Everybody's got his bio. Uh, I hope you will look at it, and I hope you will read it. Um, so I'll go from the beginning of his career and to the end, and I'll leave the rest of it for you to read. Um, it is a pleasure to have a Dallasite. Uh, the Admiral went to Jesuit High School, and is very proud of that, as he should be. Um, so he's a hometown boy and went to attend the Naval Academy. And for that service, we are deeply uh, grateful. And he ended his uh, career is the Admiral and Commander of the Fifth Fleet. For those of you who, like me, are um, history buffs, um, bad history buffs, but we love it anyways, that might resonate with you. Um, that was Spruance's fleet in the Pacific in World War II, so an illustrious group that has a deep, deep heritage. Um, so with that, um, Admiral, Bill, uh, Admiral Walsh, um, welcome. Thank you for joining us, and as always, Really got to say it again, appreciate your service to our country. Hey, Mike, great to be with you and the group. I look forward to these sessions. We've had a, a couple of them over the years, and it's a great opportunity to, to really to discuss what's on people's minds and kind of take a look at the world and, uh, and internalize it and understand what, what are the challenges and what does that all mean to us? I think for the Dallas area in particular, this churn that we've uh, experienced and now culminated in uh, really historic sorts of reactions from our community. It begins in October of last year with the tornadoes that came through, ripped through Dallas, Fort Worth in a way that I've never seen before. You can look at the just the growth of the trees that were in the community that were hit, and it's quite obvious they've never experienced anything like that. That swath just took a rip right out of Dallas, and then uh, then we go into COVID, and then we go into the, the crisis that you described, and I think um, appropriately quoted Dr. Martin Luther King. So it's a chance to, to really think as a team and as a community, uh, what are we seeing? How do we internalize this? What actions should we be taking as a result of that? Because Hope in crisis comes from within. Finding the physical and the emotional stamina to stare down at uh, a big problem and realize that we're bigger than this and that we can summon the energy of the, of the group that's on our team to defeat this problem. It is a longstanding issue and one that requires a sustained approach, I think, from everyone. Yeah. Um, so... I'd like to start by asking you to talk about a, something that happened in your professional career, your previous professional career as an admiral. Um, I'm going to profile a little bit, but I'd like you to talk about it because 
a lot of the lessons learned, I think, are appropriate. Um, with the Fifth Fleet, a major tsunami hit Japan, population 125 million. And um, apart from the loss of life and the physical destruction, a truly existential crisis came out of it was the hit on the reactors, the nuclear reactors. We have meltdown and we have possibly something that might vacate islands, culture, history. And you were sent there and you were tasked and you had to walk into different languages, different culture, different politics, different policies, um, and a care for your own fleet um, of nuclear fallout while caring for a, a group. And that was a, a very um, difficult dilemma. I'd like for you to paint that picture a little more for everybody, if you could, what you knew, what you didn't know. And then I'd also like you to talk about a little bit in not crisis management, but crisis leadership and how you approach that. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Since Japan is the most instrumented country in the world, we can now recreate and understand the events that took place. So it's 2.46 in the afternoon, Japan time, on the 11th of March, 2011. 65 miles off the coast of Sendai, which is on the eastern side of, of Japan. At a depth of about 21,500 feet, the Pacific Plate and the Eurasian Plate, which had been pushing underneath each other at the rate of about three inches per year for hundreds of years, at that point released energy in the form of an earthquake and then displaced 10 billion tons of water that had it racing towards the coastline of Japan at the speed of a jet at about 500 miles per hour. That wave crested to 133 feet and reached in like an egg beater, six and a half miles, grabbed everything within its reach and pulled it back out to sea. The picture that it left when we arrived was one that we had never prepared ourselves for or seen before in our lives. We had super tankers on top of buildings, trains, subways, automobiles, and, and homes pulled out to sea. Loss of life was about 20,000 people. Uh, 400,000 homes were destroyed. The, um, the wave that hit the, uh, the coastline of Sendai uh, was one that uh, that they had never witnessed before because when this earthquake first took place, we thought there was a problem with the technology because anything over an act, a magnitude of 8.3 in Japan is a thousand year event. This was 9.1. For those who have been in an earthquake before, it usually lasts between uh, 30 seconds to a minute and a half in terms of the shaking and the rattling and rolling that, that takes place afterwards. This went for five minutes. It was then followed by 1,500 aftershocks at an average rate of 7.5. This was uh, by any measure uh, something that no one had ever prepared for, planned for, or discussed. Um, individually, yes, earthquake, yes, tsunami, but then what followed was uh, the loss of primary, secondary, and tertiary power to Fukushima power plant, which resulted in a core meltdown for plants one, two, and three out of the six plants that were there. Adjacent to, it, to each plant was a spent fuel cooling pond, which is where the spent rods go after they've been used for commercial use. It takes hundreds of years to get that radioactivity to decay over time and requires fresh cooling water during that entire period. All of that was lost with, uh, with the loss of primary, secondary, and tertiary power. The implications then were for a cascading set of casualties that resulted in the release of nuclear uh, radiation into the atmosphere that then fell to the ground, went into the food supply, the water supply, and was tracked around the country by vehicles. When we arrived, which was about 48 hours after the meltdowns took place, 
we were looking at a situation where we were contemplating the evacuation of Japan. So it was uh, particularly for U.S. citizens, and if U.S. citizens left, then many in Japan themselves would leave. So we were fighting a fight here that was uh, on many levels what you described in the introduction, an invisible enemy. It was radiation. It could be lethal, and so people were afraid of it, and people were uh, concerned about leaving. But in order to leave, they had to queue up either for a bus or a boat. And that exposure outside could, could, uh, could create the problem that they were trying to avoid. So we had a, an issue on many fronts in terms of trying to land on our feet, deal with a problem that no one had ever expected, and then realize the solutions that we needed to create were the best that the world could offer. That statement in and of itself, this on a different plane. What that meant was recognition that the tools that I have, organization that I have behind me, is not equipped to deal with a problem that's of this size or scope. It's a recognition that the traditional way that we would try and approach a problem like this, which is to come in with an organizational model where uh, one person's in charge and we have senior subordinate relationships based on authorities and resources that would then go solve the problem. We needed a different orientation for uh, a problem of this magnitude. And the orientation that we needed was one that was more horizontal than vertical. And what that meant was that we were building a team of the international nonprofit organization, all the ministries in Japan, the U.S. Armed Forces, and the Self-Defense Force of Japan horizontally. So our organization was built for unity of purpose, not unity of command. One of transparency where everyone got the bad news as well as the good news at the same time. And then, and then we had to seize the moment and realize what, what people needed. What people needed was information so they could make decisions on what to do. The traditional means of communicating were falling short in terms of being able to rapidly disseminate information. So we turned to social media. With social media, we were able to develop a rhythm and a cadence of communicating based on information as it was coming in real time. We were able to access all the radiation sensors that are in the country of Japan and present them so people could see real time what the actual radiation levels were and what types of radiation they needed to be concerned about. Slowly, over time, we helped to rebuild the critical issue here, which is trust, being able to trust leaders and institutions that are providing unvarnished, absolutely uh, truthful data. See, Tokyo Electric Power Company had lost that trust with the people of Japan because even though engineers were quite aware of the situation inside the reactor plant and were very concerned about it, TEPCO leadership did not represent that to the country of Japan. And that created a long-standing issue on trust, and trust is very hard to repair, particularly in a crisis situation. Uh, in terms of just how to handle a, a situation like that as an individual leader, I think the, the first prize that I had when I arrived and I met with the Japanese media was there an expectation that, that I was going to lead them to a solution and a positive outcome, where I had my own uh, concerns and trepidations about our ability to understand what we were up against and our ability to, to put this crisis on the right sort of path where we, could, um, where we could find a way to mitigate the consequences of what we were living with and at the same time do it in a way that, that recognized how important it was for the people of Japan to see their representatives leading the effort. So there was a cultural understanding of, of who we were working with and what was important to them that, that just simply could not be overlooked. And once we were able to, to put together that kind of formula, I think we started to see some results. Mike, I'll pause there and see if that's answering your question. Yeah, it's just so fascinating to listen to a description of something so far away, 
so different and just continually play through what's happening right now here and the language you use and the words you use um, remain so apropos. I'm going to ask another question, then we'll start tying them together. Um, when we were talking the other day, um, Anna Proctor was looking forward to uh, asking you a question. So I'm going to ask her question for you, which was, um, you've led in the public sector and the military, and you've led in the private sector. Um, which is easier in terms of leading in, 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 in crisis? And is it the public sector or the private, or what are the differences? Well, there, there are certainly differences in leadership and management. Um, the leadership challenges that I was up against are life and death sorts of challenges. The leadership challenges and the management challenges that I see in the private sector uh, don't go to, at, at least the exposure I had, don't, don't go to that level. But there are very different philosophical places in which leaders start in the private sector, particularly entrepreneurs and, and those that are in the public sector. As I, as I laughed with Anna in my answer to her, remember, I'm on a ship. And so it's not as if I can simply fire someone and send them off the plank and expect a replacement to show up the next day. It doesn't work that way when we're 5,000 miles out at sea. So whatever challenge I have with a particular individual or group of people that I'm trying to manage and lead, I have to figure that out to include, I have to change my, my approach sometimes because uh, especially in today's environment where we communicate in ways that can often be passive. In other words, we'll send an email, we'll send a text, and we'll expect things to just happen. And, and life doesn't work that way, particularly in an operating environment where we're, you know, we're operating off an aircraft carrier. We've got um, uh, 5,000 people, and, uh, and the average age is between 20 and 23 years old or so on the flight deck. So the environment, the operational environment that I described is one that challenges leaders to be uh, listeners to be creative and find a way to empower people and make them stakeholders in an outcome. In the private sector, what I found is that entrepreneurs tend to, especially when they're um, working with new ideas, they want to make decisions early. Uh, fail early is often the phrase that I hear. And I've seen uh, a different view in terms of, of how long they'll hold on and retain people, particularly if they've got a bottom line that they're trying to meet and they're not satisfied with the overall performance or efficiency of the group. And those decisions are made swiftly. And as a result, what we found is uh, over time, um, the, the model that we've used to understand how the family unit works, how loyalty works inside the family unit towards a career or to an organization, an office or a company, changed dramatically from from my experience uh, in the public sector, meaning that um, dad or mom got laid off, dad or mom got fired, dad or mom, uh, we were bought out, and now we're working for another company, and we don't know how long we're going to stay. Uh, so mergers and acquisitions, as well as individual personnel actions, uh, far different than, than my exposure. With the, with the military, that's not to say, you know, in the public sector that they're tolerant. It's just that uh, due to the nature of the way we operate and the conditions that we operate in, uh, people have, have some time to grow up and learn. And we find there's a number of people that come that uh, matriculate right out of high school. And, and now the, the quality of the recruits that we take all have uh, high school degrees and diplomas. That was not, high school diplomas was not an option many years ago. I joined during the Vietnam era. And, and we had maybe 80% or so had graduated from high school. The rest, the rest were usually running from prison or from some other sentence that a judge offered and said, hey, you can join the armed forces or you can go to jail. <laughs> so, so we got them. Um, so we've lived through an era of um, drugs, and then we had drug testing. And that seemed to, to really raise the quality of the performance of the team as well as their health and welfare. And in, in the private sector, 
there's a, there's a lot of demands, and, and I'm going to elaborate on that, in terms of how the family unit participates in a career. Uh, what, uh, what I learned when I was the chairman for the Department of Leadership, Ethics, and Law at the Naval Academy is that we were running into a number of behavioral issues, and, and folks were, um, you know, the people who were reading the paper were asking, what are you guys teaching them as far as leadership, ethics, and law? Because we had, we had people involved in drug rings, car theft rings, all kinds of things in the late 90s. And, and the answer was um, you had to be really careful about what you teach versus the example that you set. And I'm not trying to say that we were setting a poor example as far as those criminal acts. But when men and women work together in the workforce, uh, you can undo a lot of good if people – don't set the example of the proclamations that they're trying to make. And so that could, that could be a real problem. The other demographic issue that we ran into is that uh, for my class coming out of, of uh, the Naval Academy in 1977, 86% of us came from what we called uh, a traditional home where one adult was an income earner, the other adult was raising the family. Uh, for the class of 2000, which was the one I was most familiar with, uh, that number was 5%. So 95% were coming from either a dual income family or a family where uh, there was uh, only a single parent. The net impact of that was that kids were learning their values in their formative years from somewhere else other than home. They were learning it from media, they were learning it from entertainment, they were learning it from friends, they were learning it from daycare, they were learning it from schools. And, and the, the point that I'm making here is during this period of time, I'm watching this migration of obligations to families increasingly going somewhere else uh, other than from the home. And as a result, we see greater expectations on society, community, schools, police to, to deal with issues that, frankly, um, we had to deal with at home. So one of the challenges that we had when we were, we were matriculating um, young men and women from uh, officer candidate sources as well as from high schools is that we really had to, to take a close look at our own behavior, and we had to be we had to be the examples of behavior standards that we were trying to set. There was no longer the ability, which we were guilty of in the past, of you know what happens at sea stays at sea. What happens at sea is important, and everybody sees it. And you can undo the good order and discipline and, and the ability to have an environment where people feel safe and, and the opportunity to succeed if, if leaders misbehave. So that was... That was one of those lessons that I, I didn't expect to learn, but I've carried that with me as I look at some of the challenges in communities today. So I, I want to jump back into that in, in a little deeper because you've talked just now about communication. You talked about tone. You talked about clarity, conviction, steadfastness with rhythm, um, openness, buy-in, co-authorship. You, you talked about all that, but you also just dropped a word in there that I've heard you use before um, in other conversations, you use the word values. And in our previous conversation, you used two words that are gargantuan words. You use the word values and virtues. And in, in talking about leadership, especially in times of crisis, especially when it comes to words like trust. And trust, respect is given, trust is earned. Respect should be given. Trust must be earned. And you always correlate those in your words in different ways back to values and virtues, our, our behaviors, our beliefs. Can you talk a little bit more, just dive deeper into values and virtues in leadership yeah. in crisis? Yeah, thank you. I, I, I would start with uh, the leadership model that I have in mind. So it's not as if I read a history book and, and wanted to uh, – joined the military in 1973 as we were coming out of Vietnam. Uh, the, the leadership model that I have in mind is, is the one that I saw at home, which was 
Um, I'm the oldest of six. Dad was at a high school all those years, and uh, that high school was Jesuit. And so for me growing up, the, the coaching model, he was a basketball coach and athletic director, was the model of leadership that I saw, I witnessed, I grew up with, and I couldn't find anything better than that. So when I, when I talk about um, values and virtues, I, I have my father in mind, and it comes from uh, an approach that he took that was very selfless. It was always team-oriented, that the team got the credit when we succeeded and the coach uh, took the blame when they failed. Uh, it was one of those things where he was quick to to find a way to motivate the group around him because he couldn't play himself. All he could do would, would ask that the five players on the court would be an extension of his thinking, his approach, uh, when to be aggressive, when to hold back, and when to be smart about uh, how to play the game and to always enjoy the game and the, t and the people that you're with. I found that same level of satisfaction through uh, aviation. So that's the, at the core, uh, what's, uh, what's on my mind when we get into these conversations, because uh, to me, uh, there, was, there was no greater compliment growing up than to hear my dad called Coach Walsh. Uh, admirals were interesting to read about, but coaches were gods. And so you, you couldn't really do any better than that. Uh, as, uh, as dad got on his years, the, the team always came back to him, which was fascinating to watch. And, um, and at his funeral, when I gave the eulogy, I had a number of people who I'd never met before that came up and said, you know, you never met me, but uh, I knew your father and your father pulled me aside when I was in high school and he changed my life and I didn't play sports. So dad would go outside of his swim lane. He'd be proactive when when he saw uh, misbehavior and when he saw people starting to go in the wrong direction. So rather than to wait where, where, the, where you have limited tools in terms of discipline and leadership and management, uh, he would act early where you had all those tools available to you. And, and it made a huge difference. Uh, so, so you didn't get to a confrontation. You didn't get to a, a, a point where somebody had violated a, a, a rule and now we have punishment because punishment limits, um, you know, all the tools that are available to a leader. Uh, but if you can see and take actions proactively, then you, can, then you can be involved in a person's life that gives them reassurance, affirmation, and helps guide them because you care. And and to me, those those words describe value and virtue. You know, I had another question, but you're talking about the uh, giving agency to to somebody to to be their own uh, their own hero in a sense, and hero in the in the right word. Um, and I'm going to take a question instead of my next question that somebody else had posed, which was, and I'm going to read it out. Um, and it's very germane because it ties into what you've been talking about, but it also ties to the moment a bit. What do you see as our biggest challenges in our country today, and how can we personally serve as leaders and exert pressure on our political leaders to help solve these issues? Agency. Uh, the message I want to convey to political leaders is that the political party system polarizes us and has not brought us together. Um, I had an experience in the Middle East that I wanted to share that that's related for this, because I do think the the most significant challenge that we have is how we talk to each other, and and because we can't find a way to just simply communicate with each other, a way to represent our interest, we are constantly re um, <laughs> restating our positions. And because all we're talking about is, is our positions, and then we measure success by the ability for us to, to, to find some metric that reaffirms political positions, I, I don't see how you get anywhere. I, I see politicians that make an entire career out of being in government, and, and what do they have to show for it in terms of the quality of life and the quality of work that are people in their district? So this experience that I had in the Middle East was uh, 2005 to 2007, I lived on the economy in the Middle East. 
And uh, I, I live next to a Shia community and, and across the causeway from Saudi Arabia, a, uh, a Sunni dominated population. The country that I was in, Bahrain, was uh, 75% Shia, and it was ruled by a monarchy that was uh, Sunni. Sunni population was about 20% or so of Bahrain. So you had ten uh, religious tension. You had friction in ways that uh, dates back hundreds of years. What was telling to me as, uh, as I entered into these various circles for um, communications, because that's where the, the Fifth Fleet headquarters was located. I was the naval component commander to the Middle East and, uh, and then later on to the Pacific Fleet Command. But in that, in that position, I found myself um, in the minority. I was in the minority because of uh, my race. Uh, I was in the minority because the color of my skin. I was in the minority because I was an American. And, and I was in a uh, predominantly Arab uh, population. And, um, and what, uh, what was really interesting to me, you know, when the light comes on, is that now I understand. I had, uh, I had been listening to messages coming out of Des Moines and listening to messages and thinking that this will never play in Dubai. When you're in the minority, especially if you've moved from the majority to the minority, when you're in the minority, you hear things, you see things, you, your antenna picks up and assimilates information differently than when you're in the majority. When you're in the majority, you don't think twice about it because everybody thinks like me, right? When you're in the minority, you're aware of posture. You're aware of the way people talk to you. You are aware of the language they use. You look at their eyes when they're talking. You, you follow their body language. And, and you internalize communications and messaging in ways that you don't think twice about when you're in the majority. And once I had that sort of exposure, then I realized um, that at the root, this, this is the issue, is that we're not listening we're not listening to what the minority has gone through. We're not listening, we're not hearing, nor are we acting proactively on the needs of our fellow man. At the root of this current issue that starts with this terrible, horrible, brutal um, act of murder comes um, the recognition that we, we operate with the assumption that our institutions protect equality and justice under the law, equal protection under the law. And if we don't have that, then at its foundation, all of this starts to come apart. So our role has to be one where we nurture and reinforce the institutions that are charged with the responsibilities that we give them as people. We cannot just passively sit back and expect that to happen. Over the last several decades, increasingly over in time, we find less and less people interested in being part of government. This is a, a personal observation. I'm not sure if, if, if people accept it or not, but my personal view is, uh, is one where uh, I've seen what it takes in order to get up in the morning and in our case, put a uniform on and, and get out and do something that's really hard and not trying to, to toot our horn for it, but we expect other people to take care of this problem for us. And until we're willing to be part of the solution, meaning actively involved, then it's difficult to imagine that this, that this problem that we're currently experiencing is just simply going to peter out and go away. It's going to linger and become part of the narrative, which then becomes um, much more uh, intense and much more violent, I think, uh, unless it's addressed and dealt with today. Uh, Mike, how's that for a starter? 
Um, great. I'm going to have a follow-up question. But again, um, I would welcome anybody to send more questions to Holland. Um, I would more prefer to be a conduit of your questions for the Admiral than uh, me ask a question. If, they, if you don't have questions, I promise you'll have a list. But it's really about you having a chance, and we're just trying to organize it this way since we're not in a room together. Um, another follow-up question really kind of comes on the heels of that one, which is um, how, ha how have you found a positive, possibility-focused outlook in times of high stress and crises with a large number of uncontrollables? You talked about Japan. In another conversation, you talked about the uh, as we would say in, in engineering, the indeterminate variables flying at you, and yet you must have a um, a positive possibility focused outlook that leads to from a, as a leader. Can you talk about that from a leadership position of how do you hold yourself to stay positive and possibility focused? I gave my first press conference in Japan after I arrived, and. And the answer to that question came from the faces that I was looking into. People were clearly disturbed and distraught about the level of destruction that had taken place in their homeland. It was, it was quite clear to me when I, when I visited with the press and I met with individuals who were living in schools because their homes had been destroyed, that they were trying to bring some sense of organization and order to their family unit. There was a, uh, an elderly woman who took my hand and bowed, and she would not let go of my hand as she wept and said, thank you for being here. The place where I, I turned to to, uh, to find the reserve and to be able to, to stand up in front of people and offer uh, an outlook were one that we, uh, one that is uh, both realistic and optimistic at the same time, a recognition of the challenges that we have, but optimism in terms of how we're going to unpack this problem and, and work through it one step at a time, uh, gives people, I think, a better sense of confidence rather than a high gloss sort of approach that ignores the problem but offers the, you know, the bromides of, of uh, you know, here in a couple of slogans is the way we're going to work our way through this. People wanted to hear the specifics. And, and the other thing that I, I told the press, even though I had been with them for an hour, is that I'll stay until I answer all your questions to the best that I can. Uh, that seemed to give them a bit of confidence as well. So, so there's a combination of both uh, physical and emotional stamina that's critically important in the way you present uh, yourself in, in terms of trying to deal with their issues and, and grabbing their problems and making them your own. That's a good formula to keep in mind. There's, uh, there's 46 people listening in right now, and um, I think most of them went to college. A lot of them went to graduate schools for one thing or another or uh, looked for ongoing education. Obviously, this leadership program, they have a class every year, but everybody who's here today has already gone through the class. They're coming back for more. I want to ask you a really personal question. I know from conversations in the past that you went back to school, and you went back to school, and you went back to school. And I know a lot of that was uh, war college, mandatory. A lot of that was intellectual, but I think a lot of that was also personal growth. It was probably emotional. It was probably some deep belief, a little bit of theory, a little bit of theology and emotional. Um, you've gone back to school a number of times. I want you to talk, if you would, about going back, not to war college. That was a professional education in my mind. Um, but talk about some of the education you've gone back to over the years that you think has helped mature you to become a more holistic leader that allows you to understand people, to be em empathic and feel them and, and hear them better? Uh, there's a journey that I can describe. I think it answers your question. When, uh, 
when I was uh, when I was flying airplanes for about 11 years, I had always wanted to to apply for a program called the White House Fellowship Program. It was an opportunity to uh, to work as a special assistant to a member of the cabinet. In my case, I worked in the Office of Management and Budget at the end of the Reagan administration, early Bush. It, it's a program that has uh, an education in and of itself in terms of, of uh, exposure to national leaders and then uh, in talks and discussions that go along with it, along with um, a work experience for me at OMB and then travel. The, the work experience occurs at the, uh, at the end of the Reagan administration as they're wrapping up and going into the, the first year of the Bush administration where I worked on major policy initiatives. And um, at the time, the Trade Act. That, that Trade Act was one that had language in it called the Buy America Act of 1933. It was under revision and uh, in the 1988 timeframe. And, and what was interesting to me as I, as I looked at that um, is I found out that the reason why we had a Buy America Act is in the depths of the Depression, the lowest bid for the Hoover Dam came in from Nazi Germany, and they were about to award that to the Nazis um, at a time when um, the country needed to work but didn't have a bid on the table, and as a result, this debate takes place in Congress in the 1933 timeframe about how to look after the American worker in view of all of these things that were going on. So I did the legislative history, I prepared all that, and, and then um, during the decision meeting that was taking place in OMB, I was invited not to go to the meeting because they said they didn't have enough room. So I realized, okay, um, I'm going to have to bring more than energy and enthusiasm to a problem. I need to, I need to figure out um, a way that I can make my contribution. I went back to the fleet, and and I learned that there was a program that the Department of Defense supported at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy as part of the Tufts University campus, and I applied for that while we were racing to um, the Gulf as a result of the. Uh, Iraqi invasion of Kuwait in August of 1990. I applied to the Fletcher School and I said, you know, if um, because there's an essay question I'm trying to answer uh, about how much I knew on law and diplomacy, and I, and I said I'll be the first to say I I don't know much. I can just recognize when it's failed. Um, if I get into the program and I survive the war we're about to go in, I'll have plenty to talk about. And so I got in, and. I got to stay a, a second year, and what um, and what I wanted to do at the Fletcher School, which is a a, a program that's that's uh, multidisciplinary in its approach. So think breadth in, instead of depth. Think of people who who leave that program and go to be operators at the State Department, uh, foreign service officers, or go into international business, or or go back to the military. Um, I, I wanted to learn about the war I had just been in. I flew 35 missions or so and had, had been in combat, had been in a multinational environment, uh, was intrigued by all of that because of the extent to which we went to build the coalition. So we added countries to the coalition like Syria and Egypt. Egypt, we forgave $7 billion of debt so they could be part of the coalition, and Syria – uh, we made them a coalition partner, and and yet we had just dropped bombs on them a few years earlier. So so being able to kind of piece all that together in an academic setting and understand through research and interviews what is it that that made that work was really interesting. As uh, as I came back from the Gulf War, I was invited back to OMB by some of the career staff and said, you know, we have a problem. I said, what is the problem? We won the war. I said, well, the, the cost of the war was $59 billion and, you know, pretty expensive. And, and I said, well, what's the problem? He said, when we looked at the contributions from the coalition partners and the receipts in kind, we have 60. So we have a net asset here. It looks like we've made money off the war and we don't know how to score that in OMB language. So, um, really interesting what happens when you, when you bring legitimacy, rule of law, 
a, a, an understanding of international law and order and you put it in a context of, you know, we've tried every step possible to address this and now uh, we have to pull the trigger. So when I did that, uh, I went back and I looked at command and control structures throughout history of how to build a coalition. The, everything that I learned from that, I took to Japan and I applied it to developing what I described earlier in our talk about this horizontal organization that's a variant of uh, best practices in the past and, and what it would take in order to build something that could hold people together, focus on the problem and dissolve when the problem is over uh, in a way that we moved the, the U.S. approval rating from 33% when we originally got there to upwards of 92 or 93% when we left. So, so it worked for the Japanese people. It worked in terms of dealing with the immediacy of the problem. And it gave us an opportunity to see that, you know, when you, when you self-admit that I've got a big problem and I need all the answers that I can possibly get, you can really get things accomplished in ways that no one ever imagined before because that's what a problem does for you. It forces you to think differently. Ironically, when I came back, and retired, moved back into the area, the first thing the U.S. government was going to do was to shut down uh, because we couldn't get through a budget drill. And so uh, amazing what we can do when we all agree that there's a problem. But there's some in the case of the budget example I give you just now that say, you know, that's the best way to get things done. So um, pretty remarkable study of human behavior. Okay, I, I want to lighten it up a bit here because I've got a We've got a, a number of questions. We're going to run out of time. Um, but I want to kind of shift to another piece of leadership and lighten it up. Before I ask the question, though, I want you to tell a quick story that I know, which is you've, you've retired, you've come back to Dallas, and you've said, I just want to get back to a private life. And you were asked to go to one more function where they could acknowledge you. And you didn't really want to go. I think it was possibly at a country club. And they didn't want to put on the whites again. They asked you, and he said, fine, I'll go. So you drive up, you park in the parking lot, and tell the story, please. Okay, so this is a, uh, this is a, um, <laughs> um, this is the, the military ball in Dallas. And, you know, it's a, it's a chance for the retirees to, to put their uniforms back on and for the active duty to join and support. I was asked to give a, um, a short presentation that recognized uh, two members of the audience. One was Ross Perot, um, and the other was Sam Johnson, both uh, who are now passed away, uh, recognizing these great Americans and all that they've done and uh, what they've done for the military community and the Dallas-Fort Worth community. When it's over, uh, I didn't want to stay around for uh, food because <laughs> it's hotel food. And, and I didn't want to stay around for the dancing because they are retirees and I don't need to see any of that. So, so I go out to the curb and, um, and I'm just kind of taking it all in and I'm, um, I'm standing there and there's a car that pulls up and a lady gets out and I'm just kind of looking at, at how she's looking at me. And so she's, she's heading in my direction. And, uh, and I thought, okay, well, this is this is probably a conversation about you know my uniform. Uh, maybe she's got uh, uh, a relative who's in the service, or she had a question about the uniform or something. So I I stepped out of the way so that she could, you know, so she could go ask someone else like on active duty those kind of questions because there are plenty of people around. And. Uh, this is the benefit of being a fighter pilot. I, I noticed that when I changed my position, she she made a, a change as well. So this is like constant bearing, decreasing range. And so uh, I thought, okay, well, maybe she's got a question about, you know, a medal or because we're wearing all of them or stripes on the uniform. And so I made another correction, hoping that, you know, there's a lot of other people that can answer that question. I've done that like for a career lifetime. And, and so she recorrects, uh, recorrects and, and so she's now like face to face and I'm going to have a conversation with her, whether I want it or not. And what Mike was talking about is uh, she looked at me with the kindest eyes and she lifted up her hand and she said with words, I will always remember 
I parked in valet and she gave me the keys to her Jetta. So, so I, she was very upset when I had to explain to her that I, I actually don't work here at the hotel and I can't park your car. Then, then it is good to know that the uniform carries a lot of cloud. So one of the questions, and it's, it was a light question, was what is the role of humor and leadership? But there's actually a deeper, which is the humanity of, we all have the slings and arrows of our humanity in leadership and in crisis. And there's a lot of things that play. Humor is one of them. Um, how do you, I'm going to twist the question a little bit and give you some latitude. How do you use humor and leadership or how do you use compassion, passion, love, your emotions? How much of that is that when you're Admiral, you're leading your fight. You're leading a flight battalion going into attack and bomb in combat, or you're running a carrier. You're dealing with a, a melt, the nuclear meltdown. But yet, you have to be human because everybody around you is human, and they will follow leadership when you're when you're human. How do you yeah. how do you govern yourself in that? Yeah. So so it's real important. I, I learned this over time. Real important to set the stage of expectations when you first meet the team, uh, particularly the people who are around you, whether it's your inner circle, whether it's your leadership team, or it's a staff, uh, wherever you familiarize yourself, because there's checks and balances built into leadership models if you're willing to accept that. So the, the comment that I would typically make is do not presume wisdom with confirmation. Do not presume wisdom with a promotion. In other words, I need you, the team, to participate. I need you to point out my blind spots. I need you to, to be a, uh, a shareholder, a stakeholder in the outcomes that we're trying to achieve as a team. If, and I've seen this, um, I've seen this unfortunately, uh, with, with examples of poor leadership, if leaders become so arrogant that they actually believe everything in their bio about themselves. If, if they're so arrogant that they run roughshod over people in a way that uh, is intimidating, then, then you can be the leader, but you're just going to be alone. And, and you won't know you have a problem until something really, really bad happens. Um, we're going to run out of time here, and I'm going to be respectful of the three o'clock. So this is really the um, last or a last question. And I think it's a great. It was one of the questions that came through, but it's a good one to to wrap up with. But before I do it, um, on behalf of the Real Estate Council, on behalf of the foundation where we do our service in the community, in behalf on behalf of the Associate Leadership Council um, alumni. Thank you for your time, but more than anything else, thank you for your service. Can't say it enough. And the last question is, this is a really great question. It's kind of like your final words. Um, as we look to groom the next generation of leaders, what is the most important issue in our city that we should focus on? Or let me say it another way. As you see Dallas now that you've come back and retired, you grew up here. Your dad was a coach. Your, your, your hometown, you left for 30, 40 years, but you've come back to home. This, is, this program aren't just the leaders because they're making the most in the community or the, in, in real estate. They're here because they care about being part of a greatness of a city that takes care of its own. Um, either, what do you think is the one or the, the leadership guidance you would give as a last thought or as a last thought to what's going on in the moment in Dallas as you see it now? Personally invest in people. Mentor people by being actively involved. Understand what their goals are, what they want to achieve. Build a team based on what you can pass down and what you can nurture in the lives of other people. 